I'm Mike Hallett, and um, I'm the instructor for data science in biology, bioinformatics at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, in the fall of 2020. Uh, so this course has been modified for our COVID-19 reality. Um, wow. Uh, We've tried our best to make it uh, the format as appropriate as possible for this material so that um, we all get something and what we need from it. Uh, today, um, I'd like to uh, introduce myself a little bit uh, uh, in, in motivate the course, the course material, um, you know, and also then go on to talk about the logistics, mechanics of how the course is going to go down. And then, uh, yeah, so end on some discussion about what's expected of you and what's expected of me well okay so without uh, further ado we should move over to some slides okay as i mentioned we have a few things to get done today the first thing is uh, a link to my lab uh, right here um, some pictures of it right here uh, you'll see that you can learn a little bit about our research if you're interested in some of the things that we're interested in. There's a um, menu here, Courses, and you'll find the link to this particular course here. Email and Twitter, although we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, okay, so this is my group. Okay, actually, she's not, and this is actually my wife. Um, so but uh, you might recognize some of these guys from the hallways of the Department of Biology. Okay, so um, I thought I'd maybe give a little bit of history of uh, how I got to in this field, and that would motivate a little bit about um, the material in the course and why it's important. So I began my PhD in computer science at the University of Victoria in the early 90s. Uh, I got really interested in some computational challenges associated with the physical mapping and assembly of um, DNA sequences uh, produced by the sequencing technology back in the day. Um, so that was my first real exposure to um, the life sciences. I was more born a mathematician, computer science type and most of my training at Queen's as an undergrad reflected that. Uh, in the early 90s, you, you saw the advent, um, the birth of the Human Genome Project, really. Uh, so this was um, a major effort, international, to sequence the entire human genome. And that seemed like a pretty arduous goal back in the day, uh, especially given that we hadn't yet even succeeded in um, sequencing a bacterial or archaeal genome, something much smaller. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons why the Human Genome Project was sort of brought to the forefront. Part of it was social political, so the end of the Cold War. Um, there was a lot of uh, quantitative researchers, computational people, mathematicians, statisticians, but also chemists and physicists that had to reorient from their previous research directions towards you know, military uh, use and find new domain. And well, as a PhD student, I definitely was more attracted to the life sciences than to the death sciences. So um, from the mid to late 90s, uh, well, you, you, we saw, uh, I moved to the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland as a postdoc, and we saw the first um, complete uh, genome produced. Uh, that was for Haemophilus influenza, and it was relatively small at just under 2 million base pairs, nucleic acids. Uh, it took about um, five more years to complete the first draft of the human genome at 3.7 billion base pairs, so significantly bigger, three orders of magnitude. Um, it's kind of interesting to note that the classic Sanger sequencing approach wasn't ever sufficient for sequencing an entire genome. It took the advent of uh, shotgun high throughput approaches uh, for even the, the smallest genomes to be sequenced. And then it just blossomed from there. Um, we went from, you know, 10 to the 6 base pairs in 1995 to 10 to the 9th, so three orders of magnitude in size in something like five years. Uh, by even the mid-2000s, um, 
we, have, uh, we had um, several hundred genomes sequenced. At the time as a postdoc, I was really interested in building methodology to take full genomes uh, and use them in evolutionary studies. Classic molecular evolution and phylogeny studies have typically focused on one gene, something like a ribosomal subunit like 16S, and using fluctuations in the nucleotides to, uh, across a set of organisms to rationalize about um, their evolutionary relationships across the 3.6 billion years of life on Earth. I was more interested in using um, the entire genomic complement and its structure to try and uh, do the same thing, maybe in a more robust and holistic way. So um, I certainly, sequencing certainly wasn't the only technology in town, even back in the 90s. Um, there was many other things that started to come online, like microarrays that supported um, gene expression studies, so transcriptomes, ohm meaning complete and transcript meaning um, transcript, so the complete set of transcripts. Uh, robotics um, were becoming commoditized. So, you know, drug screening where you, you, you take a, a, a set of, a large set of compounds and you screen them against cells or cell lines or tissues, that was usually done just within uh, large pharmaceuticals. Now the technology was cheap enough that even academics could start to participate in this process of trying to discover drugs. And, and, and mass spectrometry was really coming of age. Uh, it was being moved out of like classic domains of chemistry and physics uh, in, in into, into the life sciences where it was becoming robust enough that we could put you know, um, cellular material, proteins, large proteins into the system and, and get out interesting uh, measurements. And, and there's many additional omics approaches technologies that tried to capture the complete uh, you know, information for some level of the central dogma of biochemistry, right? So it could be transcripts or proteins or um, small RNAs or, you know, uh, um, could be uh, chromosomal structure, it could be many different things. Uh, epigenetic events, uh, all sorts of uh, different approaches that basically fundamentally predicated upon, you know, better robotics, better ways to uh, micro manipulate, nanofabricate. Um, all, the la all the lasers from physics were coming online and that allowed, you know, us to read fluorescence better. That was very important, especially with microarrays. The photolithography for, for miniaturizing these microarrays. So each spot in these microarrays represents one transcript. So the smaller the spot, the more you could pack onto um, on a slide, uh, and and other things, that, and of course, increased and better microscopy. So that that was definitely driving things forward. Was all this kind of um, uh, injection of interesting technology, cheaper technology, and secondly, of course, we were just basically getting a better understanding of the protein and nucleic acid biology underlining many of these things, and it became you know easier. Uh, it opened up a world of possibilities. In the 2000s, I joined McGill as a professor and I became interested in cancer genomics and informatics, particularly uh, breast cancer. And I'm still work on breast cancer to this day. I'm particularly interested in uh, early breast cancers, can so um, breast lesions that are so small they haven't yet been clinically detected in a, in a woman. and um, ones that are uh, often in situ, meaning they haven't really uh, progressed to a, um, an invasive state and they're not considered life-threatening yet. So we're really interested in rationalizing about tumor genesis, those events uh, in a few cells right at the beginning of a tumor. Yeah, so the early 2000s, um, you know, as I was starting at McGill, we, we saw, you know, this commoditization of equipment, so suddenly microarrays and, and for gene expression and copy number studies, mass spectrometry, all of these different tools were becoming pretty commonplace and we were starting to develop things like core facilities and we have for example at McGill, the McGill uh, Genome Quebec Innovation Center, uh, University of Montreal has ERIC, 
um, and, and there's several other uh, facilities around, including, for example, our synthetic biology facility, the foundry in the basement of GE. Um, and so uh, not only do we get more, those different technologies allowed us to profile different levels of the central dogma of biochemistry. For example, we started to have like um, some, the early protein uh, um, microarrays. We could study small RNAs like microRNAs epigenetics through um, DNA methylation, which are basically small methyl groups that um, decorate DNA, but can have profound effects on how, um, on transcription. And then, and many other things, SNPs, polymorphisms in the community, etc. So we started to get this multidimensional or multimodal uh, look into biological systems. And I, and I was very interested in using these kinds of technologies for profiling breast cancers and that's what I spent a lot of my time at McGill doing and what we found in a nutshell was that um, breast cancer really is not one disease but it's many diseases it has um, it's really almost not even sensical to talk about breast cancer as a signal di single disease it consists of different subtypes that have very distinct um, tumorigenic events what starts them uh, but also how they progress and therefore how they're treated and, and um, uh, in, in a woman in a clinic. So, yeah. In the more recently, um, what's, you know, in the past 10 years, so what is it like, you know, what's changed? And, um, well, I moved to Concordia and I changed my interests a little bit. Um, fundamentally, though, it, my group has and remains interested in how cells are wired and we view cells as a type of molecular network okay so uh, you can think of this network as being nodes that represent genes and proteins and regulatory elements like microRNAs and long non-coding RNAs and all sorts of interesting different things and edges or arcs between those nodes represent which genes and gene products are influencing other genes and gene products and that network you know that that wiring is inherently what a cell is it, what it's it gives it it's the it gives it the cell that, that's the power of the cell to respond to stimuli um, but we know that those cells can change in a network in, in cancer for example they can change and um, those cells can be co-opted to do uh, really bad things, and that's why cancer is dangerous and, and deadly. Um, we can also purposely change those networks using things like CRISPR uh, and met other methods in synthetic biology to change a cell's behavior so that it you know, produces a, a compound of industrial interest or um, you know, reprograms a stem cell to um, target a cancer. So uh, synthetic biology and modification in the lab is, is a very uh, hot topic in the past 10 years. The other thing that's very interesting and, and my group is very interested in is single cell profiling. So um, it's now affected almost every area of life science research, okay? so. Uh, Back in the day when, when gene expression studies were done and sequencing was done of the genome or the transcriptome, you know, we took a collection of cells, okay, because those technologies require a lot of cellular content. So they might have required millions of cells. And those millions of cells were basically, um, you know, fractured. Uh, and the RNA or the DNA was extracted en masse into a pool on bulk, right? And that bulk of material from many cells were pu was pushed into the sequencer or into the microarray or the mass spectrometer. The problem is that, you know, you don't get the um, measurements from an individual cell. You get the measurements from the whole cellular community, from the tissue. Single cell profiling takes individual cells and studies their transcriptome or their genome or their epigenome or whatever level of that. these days you can do almost anything. And it's, it's amazing. In 2009, uh, 2010 was the first study that studied, that, that was able to sequence the transcriptome of one cell, and that was Tang et al. By uh, 2014 or 2015, 
you had multiple different methods. And in a single study, they would sequence 100,000 cells. Okay, 100,000 cells. Now, 2017, studies are really starting to approach a million cells. So, you know, back in 2000, we were struggling with sequencing one genome. And now, in one experiment, over the course of a couple of days, we're sequencing a million genomes. So it's a, it's a massive improvement in or, orders of magnitude improvement. And my lab is very interested in developing such single cell profiling technology and methods to analyze that data. It gives us incredible insight into what happens in a cell, in an individual cell, what that network looks like. So, um, okay, so that's a little bit of a history. See, you know, to recap here, you know, since the 90s, really, you have this um, influx of technology and quantitative approaches. Um, you know, the technologies are, are, you know, the first thing that people notice, sequencing, microarrays, mass spectrometry, robotics, the, the um, uh, mic microscopy, okay, these kinds of things. But and, and then they start to basically... First, they start off profiling experimental systems. So you take a cell line, and because you have so much material, you can you can you know, use that in these technologies. But over time, these systems are optimized, and now we can use apply those technologies down to just a single cell, never mind a million cells. And this opens up so many doors to understand interesting biology. But every time there's a technological innovation, you need the quantitative methods for analyzing the resultant data. And that's the birth. So in, in, as the technology goes forward, you also have the birth of the quantitative and computational side of biology. Um, and I would be completely remiss not to acknowledge that you know, our understanding of the fundamentals of biology has also really taken off since the early 90s. And so all this mix of technology, biology, and quantifi quantification uh, as, as a really powerful calculus. So this course here is really kind of, is, is mostly focused on the quantitative aspects of these things. But perhaps it shouldn't be surprising to, um, to know that there's different flavors of quantitative life sciences. So people often ask me, <coughs> or they suggest, you know, that, well, there's a, you know, a bioinformatician and, well, you're a bioinformatician, so you're all the same, right? You, you, you learn the same thing in your undergrads and your, your training. You have the same skill set, and, you know, you're interchangeable, basically, right? You know, this is often with collaborators, like, well, you know, you know I can just take you out like a Lego block and replace you with another bioinformatic Lego block, all the same. And that's not really true. I, I would say that there's as many flavors of bioinformatics and computational biology as there is flavors of biology and life sciences. So the toolkit that um, a bioinformatician has for working with in clinical studies of drug, drug efficacy are, tend to be very different than the tools that a bioinform, bioinformatician has who works on um, evolution and phylogeny. And again, that's very different than the kind of computational biologist that might work on methodology for single cell gene expression studies. These are really different. There's a lot of structure inside of this field and I hope to kind of bring that out over the course. But here, there's three terms that we should know. And this course is, is biased towards data science and biology. So, and I think that's because, I think that's where your guys' hearts lie. You guys are inherently the data scientists, okay? You, you want to get your data set. Maybe you generated that yourself or you basically sent your sequences off for sequencing elsewhere or, you know, you're taking data from the literature that's publicly available and you want to basically take that data and you want to, you know, move it around, wrangle with it, right? You want to uh, organize it, um, kick it into shape. Um, you want to ask questions of that data, formulate hypotheses, and test those hypotheses and see what's there in the data. You want to find this kind of structure 
in the data that, and to turn that into knowledge, right? Knowledge that, that turns around and allows you to um, basically uh, go back to your organism and test it out, validate it, right? And maybe, um, maybe there's some sort of uh, utility for it. For example, you know, the result of your res research is going to have clinical utility. In other words, it'll be an assay that clinicians use to uh, diagnose breast cancer patients more precisely. Or, or maybe it will have um, synthetic utility in the sense that, you know, you can get it better produced um, some specific compound from yeast cells. Or it has basically just, uh, you know, fundamental insight into a biological system. You know, you want to understand how membrane structures form and move around uh, I I on the ER, I, I, I'm, you know. So you're the kind of people who want this data and you want these tools to be able to dive into it and learn something from that data. And, and that's where the bias of this course is. There's also a concept or a subfield called bioinformatics. And, and, t and with this, I associate, it, I associate the development of tools or data portals, databases, okay, that make biological information. It could be sequencing data. It could be pathway information. It could be lots of different things, biological data, and make it available to all life scientists. So not just to experts, not just to other bioinformaticians, but to make tools that you know, make the data available and usable by you guys. And I think the best example of that is the NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Um, the NCBI is this really powerful toolkit uh, of data and software that allows you to explore your data. And we're gonna cover that um, quite a bit in the course. But that's different than data science, right? Uh, I think you probably can see why. And then finally, I, I would say computational biology is yet something else that's very different. And we'll touch on this in the course too. But you know, when you develop, when you sequence the genome of your favorite organism, you're gonna get back this file that's ACGT millions of times in a row. And that data, nucleic acid information in itself is maybe not that useful. It's only when you start to identify, you know, the genes in that genome that you start to see what, you know, uh, you know, what metabolic potential, for example, that organism has or how it's wired, what its regulatory relationships are. You want to move towards understanding the wiring of a cell, right? So, you know, that the raw data is not that interesting. You want to really, you know, um, annotate it. Uh, with as much information as you can. Um, doing that by hand is just not feasible. If you have a human genome that's 3.6 billion base pairs long, it, it would take an awfully long time to go through that genome by hand and, uh, and find every gene. I, I'm not sure it's even possible to do that um, by hand. So computational biology is this field that develops new uh, analytic techniques, so software, that um, uh, allow you to automatically, uh, mechanically explore biological data and test hypotheses. So for example, the classic problem that we'll look at in the course is gene finding. So the input to a computational biology program here would be, for example, that um, a, a raw genome, okay? and that computational biology tool would walk over that genome and annotate all the positions where there's a gene. And in the human genome, that's not trivial to do because there's um, you know, probably around 20,000 genes that have large exons, uh, complicated structure in general, and only you know, one to 3% of the genome is actually coding for those genes. So they're hard to find. They're, they're the needle, there's 20,000 needles in a giant, giant haystack. So the computational biology then um, is a special kind of person, usually pretty quantitative, math mathematical, computational person that builds analytic techniques for, um, for these kinds of problems. So data science, it's about getting a data set and exploring it with visualization and statistics. It's taking it and trying to um, 
you know, make sense of it. And you'll use bioinformatics in computational biology. So how would you use bioinformatics? Well, you know, when you're exploring your data set, maybe it's the gene expression of worm, or fly, or fungi, or whatever it is, okay? So, you know, you're gonna go to the NCBI and you're gonna download information about the genes that are in that organism's genome. Um, you'll download other people's data sets that uh, also profile your model organism. Um, you'll go to PubMed and read papers, uh, and that's about your model organism and complement your knowledge. That's all basically bioinformatics, and so you're using bioinformatics, but you yourself are not developing the NCBI. You're not developing those tools. In the same way, you'll use computational biology. You know, when you sequenced your organism in the lab, the first thing that you're going to do is download some software that's going to predict where all the genes are in your genome. Um, and then you're going to use a lot of other computational biology tools to analyze, for example, uh, regulatory regions for transcription factor binding sites and promoters analysis, et cetera. So there's a huge suite of tools out there from computational biologists that you'll exploit. But data science is kind of above those fields because it's using the output from them, okay? So this is close, data science is the closest to um, biology in some sense. So yeah, I, I mean, there's this term computational biologist or bioinformatician or, you know, um, yeah, well, I, I see it like this, you know, you have people who say the term ice hockey, which always makes me like, what? Um, why ice hockey? Why not just hockey, right? Like you say hot sun or hard rock. Um, the, the adjective ice seems a bit useless or, you know, it's, it's clear it's ice hockey. I mean, field hockey has nothing to do with hockey whatsoever. So it's just an unfortunate misuse of the word hockey. So that's not really uh, a consideration. It should be called something like, you know, field ball club game. And then I'm okay with that. That's perfectly describes that sport. Road hockey, okay, you know, that, that makes sense. So, you know, it, it, road hockey is not really hockey, but it's what kids play in the summertime, so it's valid. And there you need the adjective to say it's not hockey, it's road hockey, right? In the same way, uh, you know, so it should just be hockey. You know, we have computational biologists, right? And, and um, you know, I also feel a little bit like, you know, is there really such a thing as a computational biologist versus a biologist, right? Or, uh, uh, and it really just goes for a bioinformatician too. Is, you know, what's a bioinformatician compared to a biologist or a, a data scientist compared to a biologist? Is there really a difference? Um, so is there such a thing as a non-computational biologist, like a, a Luddite biologist, someone who doesn't use information in their biology, that refuses to use modern techniques um, you know, the cave biologist. Uh, so, you know, all biology is about information and computation. Um, you, you know, you get to choose uh, how good of a biologist you want to be. And I think you would be remiss not to get good data science, bioinformatics, and computational tools to complement you as a biologist. There's no way, I mean, maybe right now, you can still get away with not having great um, quantitative skills. But in the future, it's going to be very hard to survive, especially in a research context, in competitive industry complex, co uh, context, without the ability to make use of bioinformatics databases and portals to make use of computational tools for things like gene finding, to make use and to know and to be fluent in the art of data science to go and create visualizations and how to dive into a data set and manipulate it. Without that, I find it very hard to see how you can continue in your career. If you think maybe next five years, but think in the long term. So I think in the end, you know, all biology is in essence computational biology. It's information biology. We're all the same, right? So, so let me give you um, an example 
uh, of why this course is so important. Okay. There's a lot of information that's hidden in bioinformatics databases. And I, I can guarantee you that a lot of the older professors in biology across the world are still not capable of really exploiting all of that information. Okay, so there are some nice tools like PubMed. And I'm sure that many of you have at least in passing experienced PubMed. It's, it's from the NCBI, okay, the, the, the National Institute of, um, of Medicine and the National Center for Biotechnology Information within the NIH. So it's part of this NCBI um, resource. But PubMed um, is about uh, housing all of the academic papers in the life sciences. And so if I'm really interested in a specific gene, let's say the estrogen receptor alpha, um, that's ER alpha, or the gene is ESR1, and if I go to PubMed and I type in ESR1, I get something about 3,000 papers that mention ESR1, okay? And um, I could, you know, sit down for a long time and I could read and read and read about ESR1, everything that's known about that gene. And it's a big player in breast cancer. It's an extremely well-studied gene um, because of its role in cancers and in normal breast development. Um, but, you know, that represents, those academic papers represent when somebody has explicitly mentioned the estrogen receptor. They're writing English prose about that gene. Okay, that's one kind of information about the estrogen receptor. Those papers highlight the estrogen receptor. But that's only a tiny fraction of the data out there related to the estrogen receptor. Every time anywhere in the world a human cell is sequenced the estrogen receptor ESR1 or its products are profiled every time a human cell is sequenced every gene is sequenced therefore ESR1 is sequenced every time it's the R the transcriptome is sequenced every time you put that a human cell through a mass spectrometer Peptides from ER alpha, the estrogen receptor, are studied. Now, the person who did that experiment, whether it's a sequencer or a mass spectrometer, they're maybe not interested in, in the estrogen receptor whatsoever. The purpose of their study might be for something entirely different. But the point is, is that there is a data point out there that measures the estrogen receptor. And sometimes, sometimes you could imagine that people are also studying breast cancer over in Russia or Idaho, okay? They're also uh, studying breast development, okay? And so those data sets might be relevant to you. It, it might be relevant to go and look. And it's more and more the case that as we accumulate terabytes and terabytes of data, is that this information is important to us. And it's not just about sequencing and mass spectrometry. The NCBI has information about every level in the central dogma of biochemistry about genes. It has everything about the, about the genomes, about, um, about polymorphisms, okay, well, the protein structure, like what domains it contains, etc. cetera, the, the three-dimensional structure from crystallography and uh, um, NMR, etc. It has information about what molecules bind um, the estrogen receptor. It has information about uh, polymorphisms that we see in the human population. So, for example, in some, some women, the estrogen receptor might be mutated and might have certain polymorphisms that make it particularly active, um, and that can lead to cancer. And you have information about uh, um, uh, across different organisms, right? So it's not just when human cells are profiled. It's also when mouse and rat cells are profiled, monkeys are profiled. All of those model organisms have information on the estrogen receptor. But, you know, if you, if you lack the bioinformatics skills, 
and the data science skills here to go and get that data and analyze it respectively, then you're just restricted to reading manuscripts. And that's where a lot of PIs, older PIs remain. And that won't cut it in the future. You need to be able to make use of this information to stay modern. Okay, so I hope that that um, motivates you a little bit for why this is so uh, important. Just before we go to the course website, um, I want to say a couple, uh, a couple things. So then we're going to discuss the logistics, etc. Um, some advice um, is crazy as it might seem. Uh, computational biology, bioinformatics, and data science are important, and you're going to need them. And as crazy as it might seem, this is still very much an experimental science, just like what you're used to. Nothing really changes except you're not pipetting, you're typing. Uh, our ways of doing experiments is through statistics and computation, and it requires programming. Okay, and that's um, we're going to spend time learning how to program in this course. Okay, so let me really, my, my advice here is to treat this um, as you would learning a natural language, okay? So imagine you were trying to learn Russian or Chinese or uh, Cree. Um, you know, if you're going to learn Cree, it's going to be a serious investment. It's going to take some energy, um, but you need to keep an open mind and you need to practice, okay? Um, you can't come into this and read textbooks about data science and memorize information like you might do a pathway and say, yeah, I got it nailed, man. It doesn't work that way. Like learning a natural language, you know, I can teach you the words and what those words mean and how you should put them together into a sentence, but really practicing, turning that passive knowledge into an active vocabulary requires your practice and that passive to active switch only comes through um, a lot of hard work you need to really try you know if you want to learn Cree then you just speak Cree right you just go out there and you practice every opportunity that you can get okay so now we're going to go to the course website and go through the logistics and expectations of the course. I hope very much that these words have motivated you a little bit for why the course is worthwhile, important. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the logistics of the course. This is the My Lab webpage, but from My Lab webpage, there's a, um, a link to courses. And if you click on that, you can choose to go to uh, the data science in biology course. Uh, as a side note here, this is a temporary link um, as I was preparing the course. By the time this goes live, that link will have been fixed to something a bit more uh, appropriate. Uh, you'll get here um, a small introduction to the course. Some of these concepts we've talked about uh, already and a few more technical things are added um, so importantly here on the right hand side is a lot of the links that you'll use uh, um, throughout the semester uh, email for me which I actually do not prefer that much um, my Twitter handle if you'd like to follow us or my group this is course related links and all of these are very very important uh, we're gonna see that we use zoom slack um, YouTube for lectures and our studio cloud for analysis and, and programming as we go along. Uh, at least when I was making this video, the TA had not yet been decided, but the TA information will be right here. Okay, so uh, let's go to the overview. We'll start there. Okay, so we have already talked about the um, ideas of data science bioinformatics and computational biology so I don't think that we'll revisit those concepts here uh, textbook we do have a textbook but it's free and it's available from this link here uh, you're welcome to buy it if you'd like but it's free um, now note this textbook 
uh, it's a picture of it right here, R for data science. It has nothing to do with biology. It is just data science pure. So I'm going to complement the textbook with specific readings that you know um, cover the background of the biology that we're working on when that's necessary, okay? So there'll be other reading to do. And the, ch the book is very well written, and the individual chapters are not very long, and they have great examples with lots of useful practices. I think that you'll like the textbook. Uh, now, the software has, the course has a lot of software, and that's partly because of the COVID-19 situation, but really, um, it is a course about bioinformatics and data science, so I guess we should expect software. Okay, uh, the first thing first is that uh, we would really like it if you could use um, Google Gmail. I, I don't work for Google or make any kind of money from Google, but you know, uh, there's a couple of reasons. One, we use a tool called Google Drive, uh, listed here, and uh, it's free. But um, for security issues, it's better to use a Gmail account with Google Drive and you'll need a Gmail account to get Google Drive. So that's a no-brainer. Uh, the second reason is that it's a, it's a bit easier for us to keep everything um, organized if everybody is on Gmail. All of the lectures are available uh, on, our, on our YouTube channel. Uh, they'll be put here. Of course, YouTube is free. It's owned by Google, actually. So if you click on that link, uh, eventually you'll see as the course goes on, all of our videos, all these lectures will be there um, for, uh, for the course. Um, Slack, I, you may not be familiar with. Slack is free and the course has a, um, uh, a what's called a workspace. Uh, so all of you, every student in the class, the TA and myself, we're all on um, Slack in this workspace and Slack is basically a chat mechanism that um, has some nice features that make it particularly useful for companies, academic groups, etc. to um, share files, uh, ask questions, answer questions, etc. I'll give you a small demonstration of Slack in a few moments. Um, the lectures themselves will take place uh, on Zoom. Uh, I'm sure by now uh, unfortunately, everybody is familiar and with Zoom, so I'm not going to cover Zoom very much. Um, so, but the, the Zoom channel, I, I have a Zoom channel, and if you click on it, you can access uh, that Zoom channel um, from the link. Okay. Now, you need a password for our Zoom channel. Now, um, you'll get that because it'll be in waiting for you in Slack. But I don't want to put the, the um, uh, password online for everybody. Uh, our, we're going to use uh, what's called RStudio Cloud, which is a new piece of software um, built by RStudio. RStudio has been around for a long time, but the cloud is really a beautiful piece of software. It's what's called an um, interactive development environment, or IDE, um, for the language R. So. Um, R is the programming language that we're going to learn that's going to allow us to do a lot of nice data science and bioinformatics. Um, but you can think of R as being an engine for a car and R Studio as being the body that um, carries the engine. Um, the two go hand in hand. They're really important for each other. An engine's not very useful if you can't take uh, full, um, make full use of its power. And a car body is useful, useless if you don't have an engine in it. So um, unfortunately, uh, well, it, it's a minor charge, but it's $28 for the semester per student. Now, when I was making this video, uh, Concordia is suggesting that they will cover the cost, so it may be free. So I won't spend any more time on this right now. But um, the nice thing about this is that using the cloud, is that uh, you won't have to install anything on your machine. You don't need a powerful laptop even. Um, there's nothing to do except access our Studio Cloud through the browser. And I can make data and analyses and code, everything avail available to you very easily through this nice uh, RStudio uh, utility. Hardware, um, 
you know, everything listed above is in the cloud, so you don't need strong computational equipment. Uh, if you don't have a laptop at home or some kind of uh, machine, you should contact IITS at Concordia. There's a link there. Um, they do they do rent or they lend out machines. You should note though that you can get um, a reasonable Google Chrome notebook for under five hundred dollars on Amazon. Um, I don't think that you could do this course with just a laptop. Uh, no, I mean a tablet. I think it would be very hard to program just in a tablet. I recommend. Uh, a uh, laptop or, or a desk station. Um, if you're having problems getting a machine, then you should let me know, know directly and we can work on a solution. Okay, we'll come back to this and I'll show you a little bit, um, some things hands-on a little bit later, but for now, uh, you know, evaluation. Okay, so uh, for 480 students, the undergrads, um, there's going to be about... Um, eight small quizzes. Now, I don't want you to get freaked out about those because I, I think you should think of them as more of like puzzles or sometimes they're going to ask your opinion and I want you to write a few sentences. And they'll be during lecture time, okay? Uh, and they'll only be about 10 minutes long. And um, they're each worth five points, but I'll choose the top six. So, you know, if you missed two, if you didn't show up to lecture or you didn't do well on two, then no problem. They're not, they're not going to be even counted, okay? So, 30% of your grade will be these small quizzes, puzzles. Sometimes uh, on Zoom, um, I'll split you automatically into groups of two uh, or three uh, randomly um, to work on a little 10-minute uh, project, and you'll, which you'll submit right away to Slack. Uh, there'll be two small midterms. They'll be take home one hour during the lecture time. I'll make them available and expect them back at the end of that lecture. So. It's all in sync with the class. Um, uh, they should be done um, by yourself um, without uh, asking other people for advice. Uh, but it's open book. They're both going to be open book. Uh, I should put that explicitly there. So you're welcome to use resources, but you absolutely must cite those resources. And if you're really stuck and you ask somebody in the class for advice, you need to cite that person. If you don't cite that person, it has to be treated as academic dishonesty. And you're not penalized for citing that person. So uh, it's kind of a no-brainer that you should cite your resources. And I really want to stress that you shouldn't cheat. Your final exam is about twice as long as the midterms. It's only worth 15% of your overall grade. Again, it's a take-home exam, and you'll submit it after two hours, and that, that time will be set by the administration. Um, but, okay, there's no proctoring here by, you know, uh, Big Brother, et cetera. These are take-home exams. Um, uh, yeah. Finally, there's four homework assignments that are worth 10, 10 grades each. Okay. Now, I, I will ask, add that there is this mechanism here that up to five points, each person can earn up to five points. Um, uh, and if somebody helps you um, answer a question in our Slack channels uh, and they're doing, you know, they do a nice job or they're consistently doing a nice job, the TA or I can award that person plus one for their work, okay? If in a project situation um, for the graduate students, I'll get to that in a bit, or in joint uh, work on homework assignments, you feel that somebody in the group has really done above and beyond the um, their expectation then you know you can write one little paragraph to the um, TA and myself and um, we will consider them for a plus one and that's one percent more to their grade okay so again I think it um, it's there to help uh, you know to reward people who are uh, going above and beyond and um, and to allow people to um, you know ask questions uh, borrow information and uh, communicate because I think that's an important part of science. It, it's not necessarily cheating, right, to ask people for help. Um, but it's good to have a way to reimburse people and um, to recognize their uh, excellence. For diploma, genomics diploma in graduate students, it's basically the same thing. Um, eight quizzes like everybody else, but five are chosen for 25 points. The midterms are both 7.5. The take home is weighted a little bit less at five. Same homework assignments, but you have a project worth 10 points. 
um, the, in, the intuition is that the project should take as much work as your typical assignment. Uh, we can talk about projects later, but there is a link at the top here that describes just projects, um, what I'm expecting, uh, what, and I give you several ideas, I think seven, um, for possible projects that you might want to work on. And group projects are certainly possible there. You, you could work with somebody else, and that, the conditions for that are spelled out on that page. And I'll leave that to you to look at for the grad students and genomics diploma students. Okay, so, so now, how is this going to go down, right, um, in our COVID-19 reality? So, um, number one, the video lectures, uh, the videos for each lecture are available on YouTube, and they'll be there before the actual lecture. Actually, I, I, I envision that most of them will be there near the end, of the beginning of the semester, okay? So, um, you should watch those videos before the actual lecture, okay? In fact, they're going to be available here at the syllabus. So let me show, quickly show you the syllabus now, if I go there. Okay, so I, I think that it's pretty comprehensive. You can see each lecture is listed with the date. Um, now, when I walk over here, I see readings, video, slides plus, assignment, and solutions. Okay, so reading uh, is what I'm expecting you to do before the lecture. Okay, so if I click on reading here, I'm taken to a page that suggests some things that you should take a look at before the lecture, if at all possible. This will help you understand the lecture and will get you, you know, to be honest, it, it's, it's leading things to, to um, leading you through what needs to be done for assignments and exams, etc. And it has some things like points of reflection where there's maybe not any work per se, but some opportunity to sort of uh, meditate on some of the concepts in the course. Okay, so reading should be done ideally before the lecture. And the video is the actual um, video that you're watching right now. I haven't put those up yet on YouTube. But that video too is the full lecture. This is, in fact, what you're watching right now is L0. And I would like it if you could watch those videos before the actual lecture time. Then during the lecture, there is this link called Slides Plus. So it gives you this link here. That one always gives you the slides I use in the lecture. So for example, today I had a bunch of slides covering motivation for the course and some history of bioinformatics and data science. Um, those will be available made here. As a side note, you'll also have access to them through our studio, but you'll have access to them there. And then sometimes we'll have some action items that we're going to do during the lecture period, a lecture period, and maybe there are some um, ideas that I'd like you to kind of consider um, when you're walking around the city. They're not really any kind of work uh, per se. Okay, in other cases, we have like a link for when an assignment was released I won't click on this here because it's not been uploaded yet. When it's up, this is when it's released. And then they're due, for example, assignment one will be due on the September 28th. And I'll make the solution for that um, here. And I'll make this uh, also for the midterms, I'll make the solutions available there. And so basically all the events that come through. I, okay, I should note too, is that if you're a, a diploma student in genomics or a grad student, you have this project that's due at the end of term, and that date I put here December 10th, but that's a bit of an arbitrary date. I'll make it as late as humanly possible for the administration when they want the grades. But um, I'm asking that by October 22nd, you or your group, if you're working as a team, need to give me a one-page sketch of what you want to do. It's, it's really just to get you guys organized and I can give you some feedback, or if you need data sets or tools, I can try and help get you set up. It, just trying to help you guys out, really. Okay, all right, so, um, right. So then, yeah, so basically then, right, before each lecture, you have these like readings page that might have some information about biology. You'll have a little bit maybe of, um, you'll have the lectures for sure, that is basically the one hour 
one hour, 15 minutes of me lecturing. And if you watch that before, when you actually show up to Zoom um, at the lecture, right? Uh, skip down here. The lectures via Zoom. Um, when you join, uh, I'm not going to re-give the lecture. Uh, instead, um, I'm happy to be there to talk about the material and I can provide some more depth into maybe some specific areas. I can work through, through some examples with you guys. Sometimes there will be this quiz. Two times there will be a midterm. Um, those dates are all listed, etc. for the midterms. The quiz is more a surprise, though. Uh, I'm not sure when they'll be. and You won't get um, prior knowledge for when the quizzes are. Um, it's important, though, the material for the quizzes will be generally material that not from the lecture that's coming up but from previous lectures so if i have a lecture on thursday where there's a 10 minute quiz uh it could be from material from the tuesday lecture but likely it's it's from material earlier than that so if, if you're not quite up to date in the course you're not going to be punished too much but um i'll try to you know, give that a latency there okay so so the lecture times that are listed up here, up here, which are from 1.15 to 2.30 on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they're really used more for discussion between you and I. Then you also have an opportunity um, for, with labs, so to speak with the TA. And the TA, that session will also take place by Zoom. Um, and they can help you. And I envision that um, that discussion is probably more about assignments, but um, if there's time in, the, in my lecture periods, we can also talk about assignment material too. We can talk whatever you want. I would just prioritize it that uh, it's the material from the current lecture, then material from previous lectures, etc. Whereas the, the lab sessions might be more reserved for talking about assignments, but um, I'll leave that to the TA. You'll be, he or she is probably going to be very capable, I'm sure. Okay, and then, then again, that on top of all this, you have office hours. Um, Slack, uh, I'll show it to you in a second, has teleconferencing capabilities. We don't really need Zoom. It's much more convenient when we're only a small one or two people. Um, honestly, I'm accessible by Slack almost all times. Uh, you know, and I think I, I, will, I did reserve times for my office hours and... I'll be uh, sure to be accessible at those. But I, I think, especially when you're learning to program, um, honestly, you know, people use up their time, you know, uh, before the assignments are due, uh, when they get stuck on issues. And uh, it takes up a lot of my time. Um, it takes hours and hours, really, not just one hour of office time. So, uh, you know, I think I only have a finite amount of time, like everybody. Um, so. I find the best way is that you just ask the questions via Slack, and, and, and I'm going to refine that statement in a few minutes. Um, as I said, again, nobody wants academic dishonesty here. Cite your sources. These are open book. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, you should go home and immediately you know, call up your friend and um, ask about their solution, uh, you know, especially with midterms and exams. The expectation is that you work independently, and if now if you use resources from the web, etc., that's okay. It's not okay to call up your friend from the class and ask for their solution, and to trade solutions. And if you do that and you trade information, that has to be cited in your um, in your write up. Without that, that's academic dishonesty. Um, we'll talk about submissions of assignments and projects, etc., as we move along. Okay. Time management, um, you know, the readings, it's about three hours a week. The lectures, about two hours that you'll spend uh, watching the lectures. The lab is about one hour, okay? Assignment or project work is about three hours a week. Um, the Slack or office hours, asking questions on Slack, answering people's questions on Slack, uh, and interacting with the TA, about one hour. And then over the course of the term, I would expect about one hour per week that you're... you're um, learning material for uh, examination. So that's in line with the credit structure at Concordia. 13 weeks um, times 11 hours per week, so 143 for three credits. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to go into, um, uh, you know, 
be nice and be honest, right? Um, I think everybody knows intuitively uh, what is appropriate and not. And if you think that it's okay to cheat, you know, there's a nice article here from the New York Times discussing some of these issues in the COVID-19 era. Um, it's not okay to cheat, right? Uh, it's just not. You know, there's a lot of help for you, and uh, it's the way it is. There are, there are places where you can get health, um, help for your health, including Concordia and provincial healthcare services. If you're a foreign student, you know, you should be aware that as a foreigner, you have access to Canadian and provincial health um, infrastructure, and you should make use of that. Uh, it can help. Um, you know, uh, one comment here is that, as I'm sure all of you now are experts with, uh, it's challenging over time with Zoom, Slack, etc. Um, I would prefer if your cameras were on uh, during the lectures, during office hours, so that we can speak face to face. Um, I understand that this can be problematic at times, okay? And I have no problem with you turning the not having the camera on, I would just prefer it that we interact as humans, um, and it makes a lot of, it can make a big difference, right, I think. Um, even if you just turn them on when you're asking a question, say, during lecture time, I think it, um, it really helps, okay. Uh, this course is online, and the, for example, the lectures are at uh, YouTube, and if you're not a Concordia student and you're following the course, you want to audit it and you want to participate, even in our Slack workspace, et cetera. I'm pretty happy to accommodate that. Uh, knowledge is for everyone. You just need to give me an email so that I can get you that information. Um, okay, so uh, an action item here before we leave is um, you need to get your Gmail uh, account, okay? And that's gonna give you access to Drive. And then you need to send that Gmail account to our course website that's here, the link to our email address is here. If I click on that, I should see uh, biology 480, concordia uh, at gmail.com, okay? Um, in that email, uh, I would like you just to say, you know, your Gmail account, your last name, first name, and student ID, um, so that we know that this is your Gmail account, okay? And that's what you're gonna use throughout the course. Um, good. Uh, so that's the overview, right? Let's zoom back to the top here. We've talked about the syllabus, okay? And I think if there's any questions, we can talk about that in the lecture. Our resources. Uh, I made this page here um, to cover some of the major resources. We're going to cover some of these in more detail in lecture one on Thursday. Um, but we're, we use these tools throughout the course, and it might make sense to go through them sometime. The assignments, uh, there's information here about um, how you should complete them and how you should submit them, but we don't need to go into them right now. It's there as a resource for you. And as I mentioned before, um, we have this um, uh, page that describes and gives some ideas for projects. Um, Okay, so uh, I'd like to go back now in the remaining minutes to talk about some of the tools. So recall, we need Zoom. We need Zoom for our lectures um, uh, to speak to each other. YouTube has the lectures themselves. Okay, so the you know the MPEG files. Um, and we're going to use our Studio Cloud for programming. Okay, so that's how we'll analyze data and build programs. Um, the other, we'll talk about GitHub, the repo, later on. That's a bit of more esoteric. We'll leave that to another day. Uh, I think we should talk a little bit about Slack. And I'll, let me give you a little bit of an introduction to Slack. That, but that covers most of the um, things. So in Slack, if you click on that link, it will take you to a page by a company called Slack. Um, and... Uh, you'll see that you're in an environment like this, okay? And this is actually um, uh, Concordia Bioinformatics. Uh, it's called a workspace, all right? So people in Slack, um, 
I, when we have a workspace like this, this is called Concordia Bioinformatics 2020, okay, um, uh, we can invite people into this workspace, but we control who we invite in, okay? And so when you send us your Gmail address, we'll invite you in into this workspace. Actually, this workspace has already people in it. Um, for example, uh, my lab maintains some um, computer services, uh, um, uh, large servers, and researchers from all over use those servers. And so we use the Slack channel to communicate with that group. Um, on this left-hand axis over here, uh, you'll see um, a bunch of channels. So workspaces in Slack are split into channels. And we have a general channel. Um, this is basically uh, everybody has access to the general channel. And um, it's used for, well, really general comments. It's not really recommended that people ask questions in the general channel because everybody in this workspace, for example, people using our servers, can see those questions. Not that it's a big deal, right? It's just that it's the whole workspace wide. There's um, a random channel for fun, so usually people mostly just joke around in here. Um, and then you'll see that there are cha there's a channel called Data Science Fall 2020. And, and that's a, a channel um, that's going to be used just for uh, this course. Now, you can come in here and you can ask questions like, you know, um, you know uh, at channel, this would address to anybody, everybody in the channel, you know, has anyone solved uh, assignment um, four, question three? Um, and that message then will be distributed to everybody in the channel. And you can control your notifications. So if you go up into your um, preferences here, you can control... Um, uh, uh, under preferences, um, everything from how often you want notifications, so all messages, or just pe when people um, uh, message you directly, or uh, um, whether they should shut these things off after a certain uh, hour or before, um, so that at nighttime you're not getting messages, etc. So you have control over that. You can also change your in the preferences how the system looks. Um, and all sorts of different uh, features with accessibility, et cetera, and um, others that you might explore as you move along. In fact, uh, I, I believe I have this set up now. You can even make an anonymous post, uh, something like Anon, that says, you know, this is, a, uh, this is a, a post to the data science channel, but nobody knows who wrote it, and when I do that, um, it'll ask me for the channel. If I put the channel here as Data Science Fall, when it shows up, uh, now you'll see that it appears in the channel anonymously, so that um, you know if, if you're uh, hesitant to ask a question, um, then you know for whatever reasons, then that that tool facility exists there. You know, obviously, I expect um, decorum with the use of anonymous posting, and you know, it, let, let's treat it as a um, um, a privilege and not a right. Uh, so, you know, if, if there's any sort of you know uh, indefensible language, etc., used, then that would have to get s switched off, right? I think we all agree on that. Um, I think we also probably all agree that the tone of our conversations uh, in these environments like Slack and Zoom um, should be tempered, right? That we're online and it's easy to misinterpret what people are saying. Um, we're all stressed, right? We all have things to do. And we're all learning. So there's no dumb questions here and no dumb comments, right? Um, so you can create a channel. Uh, you're welcome to. So you can say, uh, create a channel. You can do it yourself. You can say, my my new channel okay and um uh, to talk with all of my friends like snuff a luff 
Snuffleupagus. I don't think that's how you spell Snuffleupagus from Sesame Street, but um, I can do that. And when I do that, uh, I can ask to invite people, but I don't have any friends on here yet, so I'll just skip that for now. And now I have a new channel in my workspace, and anything I type is only visible to people in that channel. This symbol, this number sign here, over here on this, um, well, this one here, it indicates it's a public channel. So uh, everybody else in this workspace could see that my new channel exists. If instead you want to have a channel that was private, I could do something like, you know, only talking with my, you know, best friend. And then I could make this a, a private channel and you'll see that the symbol now is a, is a lock. And when I create that channel, I would invite, you know, my best friend, uh, which doesn't exist. So, um, uh, to, to um, uh, access an individual, you use the at sign. So that represents somebody in the Slack channel. So for example, I don't think I can invite myself, but I believe my name is, um, yeah, it's not allowing me to invite myself, but if you have a, um, if you type in a uh, uh, part of a word, you can see everybody that's in that space. So, uh, and then you can invite them into those channels. Okay, so that's a nice thing because it allows you guys to go and create private rooms and um, to discuss issues, uh, assignments, etc., and work on things together or share information, whatever. There's a lot of other features in Slack that we won't go into. Um, there is an app that you can download. I'll show you that here on my machine. Um, we use Slack as a lab uh, all the time. Um, uh, uh, here we go. Um, so for example, uh, in our threads like, uh, um, Okay, I'll show you um, Slack that we use. We use a different workspace from my lab, but we use it all the time. So uh, this is a different space called Computational Biology uh, Concordia. This one's private from my lab, and we, we just use this for all sorts of things. For example, we have, you can see down here we have many, many channel, uh, channels. Um, we have channels, for example, that are high priority, the current projects that we're working on. So for example, here, uh, this is a project called single cell candida. Oh yeah, so if you want to write, uh, if you want to write a um, emoji, you can do something like you know fire or uh, um, mm, that's not a good one. Uh, how about uh, um, uh, da -da, or uh, you know check. You know, so there's all sorts. Of, so the basic um, style for writing emojis is colon. Um, uh, the, the, the emoji itself, like fireworks, and then colon. Oops, what happened there? And return, and that expresses that. Um, I can see who's online. For example, right now, Van's online. So, uh, at Van, at Samira. Whoops, at Samira. See, now I'm prompting them. Um, I'm showing biology 480 how to use Slack. Now you are in the movie. So if I want to address somebody, I use the at symbol. I can do something like at channel and say, um, yeah. So it's also an opportunity for grad students to be uh, sarcastic back. I can write channel and everybody in the channel will uh, get this message. For example, and I can send it and everybody will be notified that there's something there. Um, I can also, for example, have put my files here. If I go to information, I can see that we've posted files uh, different times, different pictures of what's going on and share information that way. Uh, we have pinned items, so for example, 
I can pin this um, using the pin statement and now it's all the time over in the um, under information if I go to pinned items I see that Van's comment is there and I can then comment on it like a uh, classic example of grad student mistake so yeah um, we create basically a room for all sorts of different things we have a room for each project but we also have a room to keep track of our computers to uh, keep track of experiment schedules to track um, uh, um, our lab infrastructure and reagents and supplies for ordering uh, for giving newbies to the lab direction for um, what they have to do and all sorts of other information. So, oh, look, Van just, uh, see, he's just posted uh, an actual example of research in real time, um, which looks actually pretty good. Um, okay, so that's Slack. Um, You'll get to know it over time. Now, the main thing here uh, is that the, there's a main, there's a big advantage of you guys working in Slack and not an email. So, what is the advantage of Slack over email? So, one thing is definitely one is that answer it once, and it's there forever right you know it's there in the channel so now anybody who has that same question can go up and search for that question and say you know what is the advantage of slack and they'll find eventually somewhere here they'll be led to that question when you scroll through I'm sure at some point you'll find and it'll take you to that um, message. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Sean in my lab thinks that's an exploding head. So the second thing is that, um, you know, answer it once, answer it for everyone, even uh, Sean. So, you know, if you ask me a question by email, I have to spend 10 minutes formulating an answer. And then, you know, it's probably not surprising that there's somebody else in the class who also has the same question. So when they ask me by email, then uh, I have to answer it again. And now I've spent 20 minutes, right? If I answer that once, or the TA, or one of you guys answers that once, on Slack, it's answered forever, and we don't have to spend any more time. It's just that much more efficient. Um, three, we have a consistent and persistent record of our conversations, right, to, um, to use as a resource. So I think, you know, over time, we have... Um, uh, a place where we can um, feel comfortable asking questions and developing a knowledge base that's good for everybody in the class. And four, it brings all of us together. Even, you know, Aki. Right. So, uh, I'm a big believer that, you know, we you need we need to stick to the slack thing and not use email okay um email is very hard to keep track of and uh, it's very 1980s right um it's time to move on so uh once you get us your gmail account we'll we'll get you that um we'll get you your slack uh login and you'll be able to go to it okay all right so um i think that this basically covers um, what I had hoped to discuss in the first uh, lecture. Um, uh, there's perhaps many questions um, that you'll have that um, I'm, well, I'm happy to answer 
in the context um, of the lecture period, uh, the first time through, and then later in Slack. Um, okay, I, I actually wanted to add that in Slack, um, you know, it's great if other people can jump in and other students can jump in and answer those questions. And don't forget about that plus one mechanism for earning grades for, for doing that, okay? Um, okay, so I think that's it. That's the first start. There's more to come. But uh, on Thursday, we're going to look at um, some uh, uh, informatic systems for life sciences. Okay, thank you.